Hello all and the warmest welcomes to yet another episode of the True Crime Enthusiast podcast, your premier North Wales spare room based true crime show that seeks to recount for your listening pleasures those cases that you won't have heard of, hopefully they won't be too familiar to you, some you might not even believe because they're so just out there and horrendous, from all corners of the UK and Ireland. Bringing you these is myself, Paul, the creator, host and true crime enthusiast of the show's title. It's wonderful having you guys joining me here as ever, and I hope that as you're listening in, then the episode finds you and yours all good and all well. So firstly, I'm back from my short break that I needed. It's never really a break, it's catching up with a lot of stuff, but I'm back now from my short break with another episode and I just want to pass on my thanks about the previous couple of episodes of the show. We had every parent's nightmare Imran's tragic story which is horrendous and if you're anything like me it kind of angered me a bit because that's somebody who will never face justice if you haven't listened to the episode yet please go back and catch up with it but yeah it's it's quite it's quite a tragic and angry one and a lonely death on gun hill is the same a complete waste of three lives in effect for such little gain for it just absolutely pointless infuriating and horrific So the feedback and responses I've had about it have been fantastic anyway. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, Much appreciated. Thanks also to everybody who joined in to catch me in conversation with Adam, the host of the UK True Crime podcast, and Chantel, the host of Lady Justice, on Crowdcast last week. It was fantastic to do. We all had a whale of a time doing it. And it was great speaking to a lot of you guys a bit more directly than I usually do here. Some of the questions were fantastic. I think it started off with somebody asking me who I would want podcasting about my murder, which, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, brilliant. I had a ball absolutely being on. and I'd love to do it again. And if you missed it, the link is up in the show's Facebook discussion group, or I can share it on Twitter. I will do. I'll make sure I get all over that. Thank you also to both my returning and new Patreon supporters of the show, with shout-outs this time around going out to Charles Paxford, Lee Bramley, Sissy Scovback, Joyce Ferris, Andrea Hay, Gary Tanton, Lisa Lambden, Sean Parry, Christopher Scipio, Josh Burke, Jen Mecklenburg, Carol Threlfall, John Saley, Jerry Hannafin, Charlotte Webb, plus Manda Zell, who's edited her pledge, and Hannah Davis, Joe Cruz, Adassa and Kate Hardin who've become annual supporters. Thank you so much for your support guys and I hope that you've got to catch up with the bonus Patreon episodes that you get for being a supporter with the latest one Disfigured being released just only a week or so ago and proper unbelievable tale that is as well. Now if you guys want to join these guys and support the show then it's very very simple and it's very very cheap. Just head over to the Patreon site and seek out the True Crime Enthusiast podcast on there or there's a link in the episode show notes each time. I always provide that for you guys to do so. Quick as a flash, you can join these guys and you can hear these episodes. You can hear such things as Disfigured or The Beauty in the Bikini, Operation Magnesium, Obsession by the Sea, just to name a couple of them that have not released. Now I have to say as well also that anybody who has tickets to join myself and some of the other hosts at CrimeCon this year the crime con dates have moved, obviously due to the recovering from the pandemic. We were kind of expecting it really, I'm sure everybody was, but so the dates have moved to September 2021. But all tickets that have been bought are still valid for these new dates. So if you've got tickets for it, guys, you might have to reschedule a little bit, but your tickets are still valid. It's all safe. I'm also at the moment curating for any listener written accounts now. If you've got a pressing tale that you think you want to tell, maybe it's one that's a bit close to you, maybe it's one that's always held your interest, something you know about, whatever it is, if there's a tale that you want to research and write up for a show episode, then please do, you'll find me all ears and you won't find me ungrateful for it either. You can get in touch with me through any of the show's social media links, should you wish to do so. So for our tale this time around then, finished all the waffle nonsense now. For our tale this time around, we're back in my home country, although not this time up in my part. Well, we're not completely up in my part anyway. And we're off down to South Wales to the city of Swansea. Now there is a Swansea, just to confirm that. If you're a big League of Gentlemen fan like me, you'll know exactly what I mean there. There is a Swansea, but it's a lovely place that I remember visiting when my best mate was in uni there many years ago. 
it's Wales' second largest city. Situated on a sandy five-mile stretch of Swansea Bay, located within the stunning area of the Gower Peninsula, which, pop trivia quiz, and the stats are not bad here, in 1956 was designated the first area of outstanding natural beauty in the UK, and is the location of the oldest discovered ceremonial burial in Western Europe, with the discovery in 1823 of a skeleton that's come to be known as the Red Lady of Paviland thought to have been interred 30,000 years BP, and which, despite its name, is now actually thought to be the bones of a young male, and who still looks younger than Prince Philip, who's starting to turn into a bloody knick-knack. What can I say? Family stress there, probably, isn't it? Swansea itself can claim to have spawned notable figures such as the former Wales manager Chris Coleman, who led us to the Euro semi-finals in 2016, Former Conservative Party leader and creature of the night himself, Michael Howard, the author of Do Not Go Gentle Into That Dark Night and Under Milk Wood, poet and playwright Dylan Thomas, and Mrs. Michael Douglas, everybody's favourite darling bud, Catherine Zeta-Jones. But my top stat this time around, well I thought anyway, is that natives of Swansea are apparently known colloquially as Jacks, a name which stems from a black Labrador named Jack, who there's an erected memorial stone to in the city today, who has the distinction of being the only dog awarded two bronze medals by the Dogs Trust, and even a silver cup from the Lord Mayor of London, for saving an amazing estimated 27 human lives and two canine ones from drowning, all in his seven-year lifetime. So you can keep your bloody lassie and your blue Peter dogs and all that. That's a proper legend, isn't it? Sketty isn't just what my mum calls what you have with Bolognese. It's the name of suburban district and community to the west of Swansea city centre, and it's there that our tale this time around takes place. Now it's a bit of a strange one this one is, it's a brutal crime and certainly a callous killer, but as for the reasoning behind it, well it proper smacks of two wasted lives. I'm sure that you'll come to see what I mean when I get to explain it later. The episode contains details and descriptions of a crime and events that some listeners may find disturbing and or distressing. So as always folks, please use your discretion whilst you're listening in. Bearing that in mind, please join the True Crime Enthusiast for an episode that I've entitled The Lethal Lodger and the Lost Landlord. The man who sat at the communal computer terminal in Swansea Library in the civic centre of the Welsh city of the same name, on Tuesday the 28th of July 2015, brought up a blank word document, and after spending some time thinking about what he was about to write, began to type. Although only a short paragraph of less than a hundred words, it was laborious for him, and he changed several parts of it a number of times, but eventually, satisfied with what he'd written, more so after reading it aloud to himself that it clearly expressed the message that he wished, sent the document to the library's communal printer. The printed note that appeared three days later in the communal area of number 60 Vivian Road, a large three-storey house that was split into bedsits in the Swansea district of Sketty, was addressed to four of its five occupants and read as follows. Unfortunately, I'm having to go away for a while to give palliative care to an old friend. I've spoken to Dave and he will cover my chores whilst I'm away. He will also be responsible for collecting rent, which may I remind you is due Saturday 1st of August. Please pay promptly so that Dave can pay it into my bank account before 12pm. Any problems, please don't hesitate to contact me. Alec When Graham Warburton, a retired Royal Navy seaman, hadn't heard from his younger brother Alec for three days, he began to become concerned. Although some 150 miles plus separated them, following cessation of his military career, Graham had remained living down in sailor country in the county of Hampshire on the south coast of the UK, whilst Alec lived in the converted attic of a three-storey red brick terraced house in the Sketty district of Swansea. The two brothers had remained extremely close since childhood, they saw each other as often as they could, and spoke or communicated with each other almost daily. His brother, who rented out the other five rooms in his property as bedsits, was a methodical, orderly man who liked routine, 
so it was completely out of character for Alec not to respond to any telephone calls at home or on his mobile, or not to reply to any text messages almost immediately, as he would usually do. And by Sunday the 2nd of August, Graham decided that action needed to be taken. Thinking perhaps that Alec may have been taken ill and admitted to hospital as a patient, Graham had made a check of the hospitals in the Swansea area, but had drawn a blank. And with no other option, that Sunday lunchtime, he reported his concerns to South Wales Police. At 2.45pm that afternoon, in response to the missing persons report, Police Constable Samantha Stone pulled up outside the terraced house and knocking on the front door, found it answered by someone who clearly wasn't the 59-year-old landlord, the tall, bespectacled ex-telecommunications engineer, Alec Warburton. The man who'd answered the door, a stocky, gruff-looking figure who looked more like an end-of-level baddie in a computer game, identified himself to the officer as one of Alec's tenants. When asked if he'd seen Alec, or if he knew where he was, he told the officer he didn't think he was in, and that he actually hadn't seen him for a couple of days, adding that he believed his landlord would be away for a few days, and even showed the officer the aforementioned note that seemed to support this. However, following the visit from police, a short time later, Graham's phone had bleeped, and picking it up, he received a text message from his brother's phone, stressing from his phone. It read, Why have you contacted the police? My welfare is fine, apart from a broken phone. Do we really need them snooping around when I've got tenants in the house? Alec. So Alec had reached out and gotten in touch. Yet Graham had misgivings about this. As we said, the brothers spoke almost every day on the landline phone, and Alec had mentioned nothing to him about heading away for a few days, nor giving any friend of his palliative care. But someone must have been in touch with him for him to know that the police had been around. If, of course, it was his brother that had sent him the text. Because there were little idiosyncrasies in the message that cast further doubt in Graham's mind that it had been. The choice of language and formal, almost hostile tone was unlike his brother, and the fact that it had been formally signed off with Alec, instead of an emoji or bruv or something, as would have been usual, it seemed to Graham that this was someone impersonating his brother. So, after mulling this over in his mind, back on the phone to South Wales Police, he was. After his persistence, because for all intents and purposes, his brother had just gotten in touch with him and was away of his own accord, it was some two days later, at 7.30pm on Tuesday, August the 4th, that police turned up once again to 60 Vivian Road to follow this up. Thinking Alec may now be home and they could put this one to bed then, they knocked the front door, which was once again opened by the same man as PC Stone had spoken to previously, a 41-year-old named David Craig Ellis. Once again, he claimed to officers that Alec wasn't in and he hadn't seen or heard from him for a few days, directing them again to read the note. Reading this, the officers asked Ellis if he had collected any rent money from the other tenants which he confirmed that he had over the weekend and the previous day, and that he'd paid some £1,200 into his landlord's bank account in the Lloyd's TSB branch in Skettys Gower Road only that morning. Some £300 that the officers noticed Ellis had on his person, he claimed when asked, were his own savings, and the other tenants in the property, those who were in at the time, confirmed that they'd handed over their monthly rent to Ellis. Checks were made at the Lloyd's TSB branch in Sketty first thing the following day, Wednesday the 5th of August, and found that no payments in or withdrawals had been made on Alec Warburton's account for several days. So by now increasingly concerned that something had happened to him and that perhaps David Craig Ellis may be able to shed some light on what that something may be, police were back around to 60 Vivian Road once again at 7.30pm that evening this time to arrest David Ellis on suspicion of theft. And this time, a different tenant, Christian Evans, answered the door. Ushering the officers inside, Christian directed them to the ground floor room on the right that David Ellis called home, which was locked and which they knocked on, but got no answer. It was decided to force the door, which the two officers did, to reveal it empty, all belongings gone, and bare hangers hanging in the wardrobe. 
Almost immediately, the smell of the room struck the officers, for it smelt very strongly of cleaning products, specifically bleach. And there was something about the layout of the room also. The sparse furnishings, the bedside table, the wardrobe, the television stand and the bed, for the only person that the way they'd been placed wouldn't be an ice or two would be Daredevil. It just didn't make sense for them to be where they were. And officers were soon to realise why the room looked like a piece of abstract art. Moving the bed back to where it would most logically go in the room, a section of carpet approximately two feet wide and three feet long was found to have been removed the remaining underlay being stained with a substance that was ominously red in colour. It was to hide this. With a missing person inquiry launched, that was carried out for all the world like it was a suspected murder inquiry, by Thursday the 6th of August, white forensic tents had been erected at the front and rear of number 60 Vivian Road, and search inquiries were being conducted in and around Mr Warburton's home in the effort to locate him. Detective Superintendent Tony Brown, the officer in charge of the investigation, commented to the press, This missing person inquiry is ongoing and the searches we've been conducting will form part of our inquiries. We are seeking the public's assistance in locating a dark green Peugeot 205 Mardi Gras model car, registration number M805HFJ, and appeal to anyone who has seen this vehicle since Friday the 31st of July or who knows of its current whereabouts, to get in touch. He also named the man who police considered may have information that was, I quote, key to the case. Detective Superintendent Brown continued, We would particularly like to speak with a man named David Craig Ellis, aged 40, who knows Mr Warburton, as we believe he may have information which could help with our inquiries. Anyone with any information which may assist the investigation should call South Wales Police on 101, quoting reference number 15002807799. Now Alec Warburton's car had been searched for over the police national ANPR systems, and it transpired that on the afternoon of Saturday August the 1st, it had been on a bit of a trip, because it had been driven up to North Wales, where it had been spotted at 2pm travelling through the village of Newtown in Powys, before later that evening again being seen, this time parked at the Pontopia car park in the Conway County village of Betsacoid, and where it had left at 7am the following morning, when the driver had been woken up. It had then headed back down to South Wales that day, being spotted once again en route. Now the facial features of the driver of the vehicle couldn't be seen clearly, but it was someone who appeared to be of a heavy build, wearing a light blue t-shirt, and when it was spotted in Newtown, when heading up to North Wales, there was a bundle of some sort clearly visible in the back of the car. This bundle wasn't there when it was spotted returning to South Wales the following day. The vehicle was then used in the Swansea area up to August the 4th, because it was again seen on CCTV, but it hadn't been seen since. Police spokesman said, We believe it is still in Swansea, so if anyone sees it, we would ask them to contact the police. Detective Superintendent Paul Hurley of the South Wales Police Specialist Crime Investigations team issued a further press statement on Friday, the 7th of August, where he detailed the movements of the vehicle in an attempt to gather witnesses. He said, I quote, We know that this car was driven to North Wales on Saturday, August the 1st and we want to hear from anyone who may have seen it, or David Craig Ellis, at any time between 2pm and midnight on that day, between Kayasus and Betsakoid, or in the Swansea area since the following day. Betsakoid is a particularly busy tourist area at this time of year, so I would urge anyone who may have visited or travelled through the area over the weekend of August the 1st and the 2nd, to think back to that weekend, to recall whether they saw this car, or David Craig Ellis in the area. The Peugeot 205 arrived back in the Swansea area by Sunday lunchtime, and we know it was used in the area until Tuesday, August the 4th, and has not been located since. We have no information to suggest that the car has left the Swansea area since August the 4th, so I would appeal to local residents to check in your neighbourhood to see if this car has been parked nearby. If so, 
please contact us. However, on the same day he issued this appeal, the vehicle was found more than 150 miles away from Swansea at 12 Keys Terminal Birkenhead Docks on the Wirral in Merseyside. Further inquiries here revealed that it had been left there on August the 5th, the Wednesday, the same date that at 10.30pm, one David Craig Ellis had travelled on the Stenerline Lagen ferry from Birkenhead to Belfast after having bought a ticket earlier that afternoon and which docked in Belfast at 6.30am on Thursday the 6th of August. CCTV from that morning showed a man identified as Ellis leaving the ferry at 6.58am wearing a short sleeve check shirt, jeans and a cap and carrying a distinctive hold-all and rucksack. It was then believed that Ellis had taken a taxi from Victoria Terminal 2 at Belfast Port and had been dropped off five miles away at the Great Victoria Station Bus and Rail Terminal which is known locally as the Europa Bus Station in the city centre. But where he'd gone from there, who knew? We shall continue following a short word from the show sponsors. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Now one thing that's certain right now is that people are struggling. For some, it may just be as a result of the effects of the current world situation, but others may have more specific personal troubles. My own personal current concerns are making sure that my loved ones are okay and that I'm there to support and look after them in the best possible way I can be, getting that perfect work and life balance so I can do so. And better help can help you with whatever it is that's interfering with your happiness because what better help does, and to clarify, it's not self-help, what it does is assesses your needs and then matches you with your own licensed professional therapist who has specialised in all manner of issues from depression and relationship or family conflicts right through to stress and even sleep issues for professional counselling. Available for clients worldwide and with financial aid available if it's needed, the service is much more affordable than your traditional offline counselling and you can start communicating in less than 24 hours in a safe, confidential and convenient online environment. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses from your counsellor, who you can message at any time, plus you can schedule weekly phone or even video sessions with them, all without that waiting room uncomfortableness and anxiety. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor, at betterhelp.com forward slash TCE and join over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com forward slash TCE. This episode is brought to you once again by Best Fiends, which I've got to tell you about because the fun never stops with it. When I'm having a break from doing the show, any spare minutes I have, I'm getting level after level up in Best Fiends, working my way on my phone through the colourful world of minutia that the makers of Best Fiends have created in the fun and vibrant puzzle game that you'll play and discover that it's really the game for you because it's great. It's a puzzle strategy game that makes you think yet won't stress you out because it's casual, that's something that's totally up my street and has me currently hundreds of levels up and still striding forward. I've defeated boss slugs, collected diamonds, met characters such as Quincy, Napoleon and Brittle, and been from the ominous ocean to the towering treetops, and each time I play, there seems to be something new every day with it. New levels, new events, and plenty of new challenges to keep you entertained, which I love. I think it's great that there's a constant slick and fresh feel to the game each time I open it. For the current times of social distancing we face, Best Fiends is also a perfect way to stay in touch with friends you can't see, as you can stay connected to them by playing alongside them, sharing your progress on the leaderboard, or you can just relax and enjoy playing this awesome mobile puzzle game by yourself, because you don't even need to have an online connection to do so. If you're totally over the same old puzzle games, then this really is the game for you. It's so much more than your average mobile puzzle game. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends.
By the 14th of August 2015, exactly two weeks had passed since Alec Warburton had last been seen alive, and police now issued a CCTV still of him, wearing a pink t-shirt and white shorts, taken from a shopping trip in Swansea city centre on the afternoon of Thursday July the 30th, the last digitally recorded sighting of him the police had available. They confirmed that the investigation was by that time now being treated as a murder inquiry, and that aside from continuing close liaison with the police service Northern Ireland, a small team of detectives had been sent up to North Wales to conduct inquiries there, specifically in the Betsacoid and surrounding areas. But the problem they faced was thus. Police couldn't outright say this to the public, the risk of possibly jeopardising any prosecution weighed heavy if they did, but you don't have to be murder she wrote to work out that if the landlord's car is seen driving to North Wales with a bundle in the rear, and it's not there on the way back when the same car is seen, then it stands to reason that it's a bundle that's been dumped somewhere around the North Wales area, yeah? And seeing as nobody drives 150 miles to just fly tip general crap, then it's got to be a bundle containing something you really don't want coming back to haunt you, hasn't it? Something you don't want ever found. Like a body. You also don't have to be Jonathan Creek to work out that the reason so much emphasis was placed on tracing David Craig Ellis, inviting him to get in touch, was because this is the person police feel is most likely the driver of that car and the causer of that body. Police now believed then that Alec Warburton was most likely dead and his body had been disposed of somewhere in the North Wales area which it transpired was the home area of David Ellis as he hailed from the city of Bangor in the North Wales county of Gwynedd. So, the areas police were looking at focused on were Betsacoid, where the car had been parked overnight, and its surrounding areas. But Betsacoid lies right in the Snowdonian National Park, which is bloody massive, you wouldn't like to have to mow it, let's put it like that. It's over 800 miles square, and the areas within are mostly either mountainous, agricultural, or expanses of vast open land, and it's proper rural some of it. Some parts are so out of it that they have gas-powered telly, bloody cardboard people, and the real ones who are there don't know what Jaws is about. You know what I'm saying, that kind of place. It would be an easy place to hide a body and for it not to be found for several years, perhaps to be never found. Proper hammering the media coverage, on the 14th of August, Detective Superintendent Paul Hurley once again appealed to the press, saying, I would like to thank all these members of the public who have contacted the incident room so far. Every piece of information is followed up, and I encourage anyone who knows anything about the disappearance of Alec Warburton or the whereabouts of David Ellis to come forward, as the smallest piece of information could prove vital to the investigation team. Our investigation and search for Mr Warburton and Mr Ellis continues and we are working with our colleagues in North Wales Police and Police Service Northern Ireland to carry out inquiries. Since our previous appeal for information to trace Mr Ellis in Northern Ireland, we've followed up a number of possible sightings of him since he arrived in Belfast on August the 6th. I once again appeal to anyone who has seen Mr Ellis since his arrival in Belfast to come forward. He may have looked for a lift, for accommodation or for work. Any piece of information, no matter how small it may seem, could prove crucial in us locating Mr Ellis. If you're out walking in the areas of Betsacoid or Dolwith Ellen in North Wales over this bank holiday weekend, please be on the lookout for anything suspicious or unusual and report it to police. Finally, I want to appeal directly to David Ellis. We want to find out what has happened to Alec Warburton. I believe that you have the key to unlock the circumstances leading to Mr Warburton's disappearance and the information you may have will be vital to our investigation on locating Mr Warburton. Please contact me directly. Now there's more chance of Meghan Markle being on this year's Buckingham Palace Christmas card than Ellis doing so because really would you? And the fruitless search for him continued as August ticked by. As said before, Police had investigated a number of sightings of him, but Ellis still proved elusive. Since August the 6th, he'd not left Ireland and gone elsewhere, because as soon as he'd been identified as entering the country, 
All ports and airports leaving Ireland had been notified and him flagged as a person of interest to detain should he try to leave, and he hadn't, so he was somewhere on those shores. In North Wales also, police continued the search for the missing Alec Warburton, but very firmly now looking for his body rather than him alive. But as I described before, the areas they had to search were vast, and it was also only going off their best estimate that this is where Ellis had dumped the body, bearing in mind there was a 135 mile distance in between where it could have been dumped. Not an easy task really, I'm sure you'll agree. But by September the 18th, almost seven weeks after Alec had last been seen, it was made somewhat easier. Now how exactly his arrest came about is unclear, but it most likely stems from a bed and breakfast owner named Nora Kelly, who runs St Clair's Guesthouse at number 39 Father Griffin Road in the city of Galway in the Republic of Ireland. In the second week of September 2015, Nora had welcomed a guest to the B&B who called himself Dave Thomas, who told her he had travelled across from Belfast some days previously and was now seeking work in the Galway area, trying to make a fresh start following the death of his wife from leukaemia. Dave had paid Nora €170 Euros for a week's worth of accommodation of €24 Euros per night, but when he was still there on the ninth day, without paying extra, Nora had asked him to leave and he'd gone without paying. Now proprietors of guest houses, much like true crime podcast hosts, do have a community and talk to one another, so Nora had most likely been straight on to other guest houses in the nearby area to warn them about a non-paying client calling himself Dave Thomas, who may possibly inquire to stay. She may have even reported this non-payment to the Garda, who possibly followed up inquiries in the local guest houses and hotels. Or perhaps Dave Thomas did the same thing at different accommodation that he went to. It's not reported exactly how he was found. What can be established, though, is that on September the 18th, Dave Thomas was traced to the Abbey Lodge guest house on Galway's College Road, more than 230 miles from where he had first arrived on the Emerald Isle in Belfast, and was arrested for something a bit more serious than skipping paying Nora her rent, because Dave Thomas was actually one David Craig Ellis, wanted in connection with the disappearance of Swansea landlord Alec Warburton. Once in custody, Ellis admitted who he was and told Gather that he'd been in the country for almost a month since fleeing to Northern Ireland from the UK. Now whether his time on the lam, with no kind of plan, no money, and the desperation and hunted feeling that someone in such a situation must have, whether this had weighed heavily upon Ellis, who knows? But the following day, after being taken into custody, he told Garda officers that he wished to speak about events that had happened some weeks previously at number 60 Vivian Road in Sketty, before admitting to Garda Sergeant Adrian O'Neill, get Google Maps on your phone so I can show you where I dumped the body. On the mid-morning of Sunday the 20th of September, Members of North and South Wales Police, in conjunction with members of the voluntary Ogwen Valley Mountain Rescue Team from nearby Capel Coorig, met at the entrance to a narrow track leading off the A470 in the North Wales village of Dolwith Ellen, some six miles from Betsacoid, and between there and Blanyai Fastinog, where their destination was the now disused and fenced off Prince Llewellyn Slate Quarry, set in dense woodland some quarter of a mile off the main road and accessible through a narrow track barely big enough for a vehicle to manoeuvre. As the party made their way up here to the 30 metre deep pit, upon their arrival they noticed that a section of the fencing keeping people out had been moved aside, tampered with it was later described as, and after preparing and securing the necessary safety harness and climbing equipment, a member of the mountain rescue team was slowly lowered down. Quite apparent almost immediately, in the dense bracken and undergrowth adjacent to the near sheer vertical face of the quarry, was a white duvet, which closer inspection showed lay as a marker, very near to a mostly intact, but very badly decomposing body. Alec Warburton had been found. 
Due to the position in which the body lay and the perilously intact state that it was in due to exposure to the elements over time, advanced decomposition and predator activity, plus the distance to raise it up the rock face, once a preliminary examination had been conducted by a police surgeon and the body had been photographed in situ, it took the remainder of that day and well into the second to construct a special harness and board support to begin the very slow process of removing the body from the quarry. Once it was, it was taken to the mortuary of Sputty Gland Cluid in Bottle Withen for a full post-mortem examination by Home Office pathologist Dr. Brian Rogers. Meanwhile, back in Galway, David Ellis was awaiting extradition to the UK. South Wales police were aware of his arrest, but due to legal red tape and awaiting the granting of extraditing him back to the UK, it wasn't until more than a month after his arrest, on Thursday October the 22nd, that he touched down back in Swansea, where he was taken into custody and charged with the murder of Alec Warburton, as well as breaching a notification order under the Sexual Offences Act which we'll come on to a bit later. The following morning, 40-year-old Ellis, dressed in a grey sweatshirt and jeans, appeared before magistrates at Swansea Magistrates Court, where he confirmed his name, and when asked about his address, answered, No fixed abode at the moment. He entered no plea when charged with the murder of Alec Warburton, and no plea when being charged with breaching a notification order under the Sexual Offences Act but magistrates declined jurisdiction on both charges and remanded Ellis in custody until the following Monday, the 26th of October 2015, to appear at Swansea Crown Court. At this subsequent hearing, which Ellis made via video link from Park Prison in Bridge End, Ellis again entered no plea to the charge of the murder of Alec Warburton between July the 30th and August the 7th that year. However, during the hearing, Ellis's barrister John Hipkin QC told presiding Mr Justice Thomas The issue will be one of self-defence. Ellis was then remanded in custody to await trial. More than seven months later, on Wednesday the 8th of June 2016, in front of presiding Mr Justice Knowles, the trial of David Craig Ellis for the murder of Alec Warburton began at Swansea Crown Court where Ellis admitted the manslaughter of his former landlord, but denied his murder. The defence argument, which was led by Sarah Elliott QC, described Ellis as an, I quote, depressed, unemployed and vulnerable man, who had moved into the house in Vivian Road in Sketty in May the previous year, following his separation from his girlfriend of five years, and that, I quote, a sexually adventurous Mr Warburton had pressurised him to pay rent money he didn't have before barging into his room on July the 30th and making sexual advances towards him, causing Ellis to strike him fatally with a hammer in a loss of self-control. But the prosecution's case, led by Christopher Clee QC, conversely painted Ellis as, I quote, a cunning, manipulative and deceitful man who told lie upon lie upon lie who totally premeditated the murder, needing to get his landlord out of the way so he could get his hands on the rent money from the other tenants of number 60. Mr Clee told the court in his opening speech, Alec Warburton was 59 years old when he died. He was brutally murdered in his own home in Swansea by this defendant. He suffered severe blunt force injury. He was bludgeoned to death with a hammer. Having murdered him, the defendant disposed of his body in a quarry in North Wales before coming back to Swansea for a time, before fleeing to the Irish Republic, where he was arrested. The defendant does not dispute he killed Alec Warburton, but will, as we understand it, claim when he killed him, he lost self-control. He's pleaded guilty to manslaughter, but having heard all the evidence in this case, we are sure you will find the defendant guilty of a most brutal and premeditated murder. As the jury was shown a 3D model of number 60 Vivian Road, Mr Clee explained Alec Warburton lived in the three-storey house, renting out parts of the house to five other tenants who each paid £285 per month in rent, including Ellis, who had moved in at the beginning of May 2015. The prosecutor continued, Mr Warburton was a very particular and house-proud man and expected high standards from his tenants. 
However, there were issues with Mr Ellis over non-payment and late payment of rent. After being there less than three months, Ellis had fallen behind on his rent money. Now one witness, another tenant named Christian Evans, claimed that Alec Warburton had had confrontations with Ellis over this non-payment and that on at least one occasion, Ellis had left the property through the window from his room rather than head out the front door to avoid any confrontation with his landlord. Evans also told the court that Alec had asked him at one point to, I quote, be a witness whilst he searched Ellis's room for the money that he was owed. It would have been entirely in the landlord's character to do this, as he was later described by his brother and other tenants as meticulous. He liked order, he liked everything being done in a certain way with a certain ratio. For example, he'd proper grumble about the washing up not having been done by a particular tenant, or the communal area being left untidy. Now I could proper picture someone like this, as I had a landlord myself who was quite the same some years ago. He was proper banzai, he really was. There's a whole bloody podcast series in the waiting there about that moomin, but I digress. Wherever it had been formulated from, and perhaps bitterness had formed as a result of his landlord being constantly on at him for the money that he was owed, Ellis had hit upon a plan. A couple of days before Alec Warburton was last seen alive, on July the 28th, Ellis had written and printed out a note on a computer at Swansea Central Library, purporting to be from Alec, telling the other tenants he was going away for a while and they should pay their rent to Dave. A note which the court heard read, Unfortunately, I'm having to go away for a while to give palliative care to an old friend. I've spoken to Dave and he will cover my chores whilst I'm away. He will also be responsible for collecting rent, which may I remind you is due Saturday 1st of August. Please pay promptly so that Dave can pay it into my bank account before 12pm. Any problems, please don't hesitate to contact me, Alec. Now Mr. Clee continued. We say this is a very significant document. Why was the defendant purporting to be Mr. Warburton? Why was he saying that Mr. Warburton was going away? We say the answer is simple. The defendant was planning to kill Alec Warburton. We say that this note was in fact a blueprint for murder. It was this because for Ellis's plan to have any chance of success, Mr. Warburton would have to be dead. Now 31st of July could be established as the day of Alec's death because witnesses who knew him had reported seeing him that day in the Sketty area. Neighbour Timothy Bennett seeing him in the area around midday, and another witness, Louise Evans, seeing him in nearby Eversley Road at 5 pm. However, that was the day that the note had appeared in the communal area of number 60, and indeed, later that Friday evening, as requested, one of the other tenants had handed over £279 in cash in rent money to Ellis for Mr. Warburton. At that time, Alec Warburton was lying dead in the defendant's room, Mr. Clee said. On the following day, Saturday the 1st of August, another tenant, Christian Evans, saw the note and then heard Ellis knocking on the door of his room. He paid Ellis the money, and when he asked when Alec had left, Ellis told him it had been late the previous afternoon. Mr. Clee continued, This was another lie, of course, as Alec Warburton was still lying dead in the defendant's room. The defendant then disposed of Mr Warburton's body using Mr Warburton's own car, a green Peugeot. We don't know how he got his body into the car, but he did, and later on that Saturday he drove to North Wales, the car being picked up on CCTV and AMPR cameras on the way. Mr Clee then showed the jury a still photograph of Alec Warburton's car, with an object in the back, an image captured as the car was driven through Cursus, near Newtown, at around 2 p.m. on August the 1st. Referring to the bundle in the back, he said, that was the body of Alec Warburton. The court was told that this journey had ended up in the Betsakoid area of North Wales, which Ellis knew well, having grown up near there, and he had subsequently thrown Mr. Warburton's body into the lonely quarry at Dolwith Ellen, hoping that it would never be discovered. After sleeping the night in the car at the car park at Betsakoid, where Ellis was spotted and woken by a police officer, he left at 7am the Sunday morning and drove back to Swansea, 
Mr. Klee said, to collect the rest of the rent from the other tenants. By this time, however, Alec had been reported as a missing person by his brother Graham, leading to PC Stone calling at the house at 2.45pm that afternoon and speaking to Ellis, who had only an hour or so previously arrived back. Mr. Klee said, He was asked if Mr. Warburton was in, and he said he didn't think so, and added he last saw him two to three days before, and said he believed Mr. Warburton was going away for a few days. Two days later, the court heard two police officers had called again at 60 Vivian Road and spoke to Ellis, asking when he'd paid the rent money into Mr. Warburton's bank account. Mr. Klee said, He told them he'd paid it into Lloyd's TSB in Sketty that morning. You will not be surprised to learn he did no such thing. By Tuesday, August the 4th, the defendant had murdered Alec Warburton, disposed of the body and collected the rent from all the tenants and now it was time for him to make his escape. The jury was then shown images of what the prosecution claimed was Ellis arriving at Swansea Library in Swansea Civic Centre later that same day, arriving in a dark Peugeot car, thought to be Alec Warburton's. Examination of a computer that he used there showed that his account was used to access the website of the Stenelink Ferry Company, before a short time later, Ellis was seen on CCTV driving out of the library car park and into the Kingsway in Swansea's city centre, where more images were shown to the court of what it was claimed was Ellis using a nationwide cash point there. Referring to CCTV evidence showing Ellis walking about in the city centre and later looking into shop windows, Mr. Clee added, There's one thing he's not doing, and that's panicking. The defendant then left Swansea for Liverpool on the Liverpool to Belfast ferry and set about disguising the number plate of Mr Warburton's car using black electrical tape. A series of camera pictures on the, of Mr Warburton's car on the route between Swansea and North Wales were then shown to the jury and indeed, somewhere en route also, the car had slightly changed its number plate. It had gone from registration number M805 HFJ to M805HEU, the last two letters being carefully altered with just two torn strips of electrical insulating tape in an attempt to prevent it from being identified. They were also shown CCTV stills of a person claimed to be Ellis entering the 12 Keys terminal at Stenerline in Birkenhead in Merseyside, later boarding the Stenerline ferry Lagan and getting off the ferry in Belfast on August the 6th. Here, he'd eventually made his way to the Republic of Ireland, where he was traced and arrested on September the 18th, 2015. He had confessed to the Garda the following day that he wished to speak of the events that happened at 60 Vivian Road, leading to the discovery of Mr Warburton's body in the disused Prince Llewellyn Slate Quarry the following day, the 20th of September. Closing his opening address, Mr Clee said, Ellis carried out a plan to kill Mr Warburton in a cold, calm and collected and entirely rational way. He callously disposed of the body, told lie after lie to cover his tracks and that web of deceit is continuing now. On the second day of the trial, statements were read to the court on behalf of North Wales police officers who'd assisted in the recovery of Alec Warburton's body, as well as members of the Ogwen Valley Mountain Rescue Team, in whose evidence Reference was made to an area of fencing near to the quarry which appeared to have been disturbed or tampered with fairly recently. When the body had been removed, a post-mortem examination had been carried out by Home Office pathologist Dr Brian Rogers, who was next to give evidence in the dock. Dr Rogers explained that due to advanced decomposition, the body of Mr Warburton had to be initially identified using dental records and told the court that cause of death was due to severe blunt force head injuries, blows to the skull delivered with considerable force. The jury was shown an image of Alex's skull, which showed a number of fractures and three depressed major skull defects in a fairly focused pattern. Dr Rogers explained, They are classic impact trauma injuries, for they could only have been caused by a weapon used with considerable force. The injuries suggest a focused weapon, something with a focused head. I was of the view these were carried out with the head of a hammer. 
It depends on the weight of the weapon, but I believe this could have been an ordinary nail hammer with two claws on. Dr. Rogers also told the court that all injuries he found on Alec's body were to the back of the head. None he could say had been caused by the fall over the quarry's edge. Some finger bones were missing, but he believed that this was the work of predator activity. He also said that of the remaining digits, hand and wrist bones, he was not able to find any defensive injuries on any of these, which he said he could not be sure of, but would suggest that Alec was attacked from behind in a surprise, rapidly fatal attack. Dr. Rogers said, Considerable force was used to punch a hole in the skull. I would think consciousness was lost almost immediately. A hole that large in the head is incompatible with life. It's highly likely he would have suffered brain injuries, bleeding to the brain, etc., and would probably have died very rapidly. Very rapidly indeed. Following Dr. Rogers' evidence, the jury heard a statement from Detective Sergeant Carl Price, who told how on August the 4th the previous year, police had forced entry into Ellis's room at number 60 and discovered a section of carpet approximately two feet wide and three feet long had been removed, the underlay being stained with a substance that was red in colour and that later transpired was blood. The officer added, I could clearly smell cleaning fluids. Forensic scientist Finley James Kennedy said during his examination of Ellis's room, Blood spatter was found on a side table, on the ceiling, on a wall, on a chimney breast, a bed rail, the edge of the carpet, on concrete beneath the carpet, and on a bottle of cleaning fluid. Mr. Kennedy added that the blood being in the defendant's room fitted with the scenario of a violent altercation having taken place there. The blood on the ceiling would either have been deposited there from floor level by blows into wet blood, or possibly via an injured person's airway but some of the blood there was diluted, suggesting attempts had been made to clean it up. Obviously no Kim and Aggie job there. Another forensic scientist, Daniel Beaumont, said extensive blood spots and smearing of blood were found in Alec Warburton's green Peugeot 205 Mardi Gras car. Blood was discovered on plastic mouldings in the boot, underneath the parcel shelf, and on the rear nearside seat, where the blood staining was, I quote, heavy and soaked in in places and running down beneath the seat to the boot floor. Whilst blood staining the edge of the car boot with some of it being smeared suggested, I quote, blood being moved across the surface. Also discovered in the Peugeot were an AA map, a bottle of Domestos spray bleach, some black electrical insulation tape, a yellow tow rope, a packet of baby wipes and a set of metal spanners. Alongside Ellis's fingerprints, which were found on several of these items, as well as on the number plate, tailgate and rear window of the vehicle, each item tested positive for minute traces of blood. The same traces of blood that were found in the rest of the car, as well as in the defendant's room. Blood that was a perfect match for the DNA profile of Alec Warburton. So with Ellis looking as up shit creek as a balloon drifting towards a lit candle, Graham Warburton, meanwhile, described to the court the brother's upbringing in Pembroke Dock before he left to join the Royal Navy and Alec went to college in Swansea, eventually becoming a telecommunications engineer. Describing Alec as a meticulous character with a quiet nature who'd never married or fathered any children, he told the court how the brothers had remained close over the years so much so that they usually spoke by telephone virtually daily. He added that his brother would often talk about some of his lodgers and their personalities during these conversations, and had told him on a few past occasions that there were difficulties over rent payment with one of his tenants called Dave. Exampling this, Mr Warburton said, He told me this man Dave had once left the house via a window rather than discuss payment of rent. It was the break in their regular communication at the end of July the previous year when the calls from Alec abruptly stopped that led to Graham reporting his brother missing on August the 2nd after not hearing from him for several days. He described how the text message he'd received from his brother following the police visit, the terminology used and the fact that he'd signed off with his name was so uncharacteristic of Alec that he was convinced it wasn't written by his hand. 
And then Ellis himself took the witness stand to give evidence. And what a tale he came out with. Ellis said he was both friendless and unemployed when he moved into Alec Warburton's house in May 2015 after seeing a listing on the website Gumtree following the breakdown of his five-year relationship with his girlfriend. Though he was claiming job seekers allowance at the time and despite the tenancy agreement strictly stating nobody claiming benefits could rent the room, Ellis said Alec was aware of his financial situation and he had moved in. By just the end of the following month however, he admitted he couldn't afford to pay the full month's rent and although he claimed to have offered to help his landlord carry out renovation work on his late father's house in lieu of rent money, this had been declined. Instead, Ellis claimed, his landlord had come into the room and suggested they do, I quote, things of a sexual nature instead, which Ellis had declined. He told the court, he said I was now in arrears and basically it was going to get out of hand. He said we could sort it out by doing things of a sexual nature. I was quite shocked and taken aback. He didn't make it quite clear what he wanted then, but it was sexual and I was not happy about it. He said the landlord made attempts to contact him afterwards and continued to warn him about his rent arrears and admitted to the court he had left the house on one occasion via a bay window rather than speak to Alec. He added that on another occasion when Mr Warburton had heatedly asked him about his rent arrears, Ellis had responded by telling the landlord he would, I quote, tell people he had a prostitute come into the house after he'd seen a young blonde woman aged about 25 to 30 come into the house with Mr Warburton on around three to four occasions. Ellis admitted that days before the assault on Alec, he had hatched a plan to steal cash off other tenants and had printed out at Swansea Library a note to other tenants at the house purporting to come from Mr Warburton, which said he was going away and that the tenants should pay their monthly rent to Ellis for him, but claimed his plan was only to steal the rent cash from other tenants so he would have money to escape Mr Warburton's unwanted attentions and get on a train and leave Swansea and was categorically not part of a plan to kill his landlord. Cross-examining Ellis, Mr. Clee said, The whole truth of this case is that letter you typed up and printed on the Tuesday was a plan to murder Alec Warburton, wasn't it? Ellis replied, Not at all. It was a plan to get some money so I could get away. Mr. Clee asked him, You put that plan in operation, so you are guilty of murder. Ellis replied, Not at all. Two or three days later, Ellis continued, on Friday the 31st of July, Alec knocked on Ellis's bedroom door again and repropositioned him about other ways to settle his rent arrears, with Ellis explaining, he said we could sort it out with a little bit of oral sex. Ellis then told the court that he was sexually abused as a child, and although charges were made against a person known to Ellis in the past, no prosecution was forthcoming for these allegations, and when Warburton made these sexual advances towards him, it caused him to lash out in rage, causing the two men to struggle. Ellis told the court, I didn't like what he was doing. I was abused as a child, and the height difference made me feel like I was a child again. Ellis then claimed he went to punch Alec after he touched his face, continuing, He lunged at me and grabbed me around the throat, and pinned against the wall. Ellis told the court of the violent struggle, during which at one point he reached for a screwdriver, basically to get him off me. At one point he had also kicked Mr Warburton to the groin, causing him to go down on one knee, and it was then that he grabbed the hammer lying on a nearby desk, which Ellis bizarrely claimed he was trying to fix his TV with. However you do that, I don't know. Mr Clee asked Ellis, at that stage, he was of no threat to you at all, was he? To which Ellis replied, I don't know what I was thinking at the time. He said he couldn't remember picking up the hammer, but the court then heard how Ellis indeed had picked it up and had struck Alec on the back of the head. Mr. Clee asked, You hit him from behind with such force you made a hole in his skull, didn't you? You used such force you made a complete hole in his skull. Ellis replied, Yes. Then when asked how many times he'd struck him, Ellis answered, Initially I thought it was two, 
but having read the pathology report, I realised it could have been five or six times. Mr. Clee asked him, You caved that man's skull in, what were you doing? To which Ellis replied, I don't know, I was angry, but I can't see any particular reason why whatsoever. I was angry about my breakup and the fact he'd asked for sexual favours. It was loss of control. Shattering someone's skull like a bloody piggy bank would suggest so, wouldn't it? Asked by Mr. Clee what he did after he realised Mr. Warburton was dead, Ellis said that as he was, I quote, bawling his eyes out, he feebly attempted chest compressions because he couldn't feel a pulse. Asked why he didn't ask for help, he replied, I panicked, I didn't think anyone would believe me about what had happened. Ellis then told the jury of how, after killing Alec, he had left the body in his room and gone out and bought a wheelie bin, had then stuffed the body into it, and then after placing it inside Mr Warburton's own car, had driven to Pennard, about seven miles southwest of Swansea, where he had attempted to throw it off the cliffs there into Hunt's Bay, but found, I quote, he could not get close enough. Instead, he ended up taking the body out of the wheelie bin putting it in the back of the car underneath a duvet and throwing the wheelie bin over the cliff. He later drove Alec's body up to Betzacoid, where he threw it 30 metres down the side of the disused Prince Llewellyn slate quarry in Dol with Ellen, a place he was familiar with from his childhood, before driving back to Swansea to finish off his plan of taking the other tenant's rent money. With the cash pocketed, he again used Mr Warburton's car, this time to drive back north to Birkenhead in Merseyside, from where he took a ferry to firstly Northern Ireland, before travelling to the Republic of Ireland, where he eventually was arrested by Irish Garda more than a month later. When arrested by Garda detectives, Ellis claimed he had asked for Google Maps to help him point out the quarry where he'd disposed of the body. He also pointed out a spot where he claimed he had disposed of the hammer that he had used to kill Mr Warburton with, a spot, I quote, in the sea off Flandidno. The weapon was never found. I just thought it was the best thing to do for Alec's family, Ellis said. Yeah, I'm sure that they agreed there too. What do you reckon? Re-examined by defence barrister Sarah Elliott QC, Ellis accepted he had lied after Mr Warburton's death. She asked him, You've pleaded guilty to manslaughter by reason of loss of control. Ellis replied, Yes. I picked up a hammer and hit him on the head, on the top of the head which I thought was twice, but now I've found out it was more. She continued, Do you accept responsibility for Alec Warburton's death? He answered, Yes. Why did you lose control so badly that day? Ellis answered, I was under a lot of stress and I felt pressured and with my background I just felt a loss of control. Miss Elliot then picked up the thread of what Ellis had claimed earlier as the precursor to the killing about the landlord requesting sex in lieu of rent by claiming that Alec Warburton had, I quote, an adventurous attitude towards sex. Now this was suggested, the court was told, by evidence that Mr Warburton had engaged in bondage, which was demonstrated by a purple rope that was found in his bedroom tied around the bedposts as well as evidence of an order he'd placed to a firm specialising in sex aids and toys. But the real clincher was the discovery of several homemade sex tapes, dated between April and July 2015, which were found by police at the Vivian Road house, which showed Mr Warburton having sex with a female escort, referred to in court as Woman X, with another woman referred to as Woman Y, with both Woman X and Woman Y, and also with a man known as Man A. Miss Elliot furthered that Woman X had told the police she'd been an escort for three years and had come to a long-standing financial arrangement for sex with Mr Warburton, whom she regarded as a friend. He does see sex as a commercial transaction, said the barrister. Miss Elliot claimed that when all this was taken together, this adventurous side of Alec Warburton made it indeed possible that he'd attempted to obtain sex off Ellis to waive his rent arrears, resulting in the spontaneous assault with a hammer and destroying any notion of premeditation. She told the jury, If you're going to kill someone and you've planned it, why do it in a way that is going to leave so many obvious traces? There's no evidence that anything else went missing from the house, 
not Mr Warburton's wallet, nor his bank cards. If this was murder for gain, why not? And why use your own login at the library to print the note off? Why not enter as a guest and use a false name? She reminded the jury of the adventurous videos and paraphernalia that were found at 60 Vivian Road, that she claimed supported Alice's story, and speaking of the haphazard disposal of Mr Warburton's body, she added, These were not the actions of a cold, calculating killer, but rather those of a man who doesn't know how to deal with what's happened, and is acting out of fear and panic to deal with it. However, in retort, in his closing speech, Mr. Clee was adamant that these claims of sex for rent by Ellis and him acting out of fear and panic were invented, telling the jury, We suggest these allegations against Alec Warburton were invented to bolster his defence. We suggest from the outset David Ellis has been cunning, manipulative and deceitful. He embarked on a plan to kill Mr. Warburton and he did so in the most vicious manner. He callously disposed of the body and told lie after lie to cover his tracks. David Ellis would have you believe the plan was only to steal, and it was hugely coincidentally killed Mr Warburton. But the plan to steal the rent money was entirely reliant on getting rid of Alec Warburton. He was a man who rarely strayed from his house, and you'd have thought he'd have found out pretty quickly about the plan had he been alive. I've already suggested the key to this whole case is that note, and, if it was printed by the defendant using his account at Swansea Library on July 28th, 2015, and you have heard evidence that he did, then it's a hugely significant document. That note was printed when Alec Warburton was alive and well, and there are only two explanations for it. Either it was a plan to kill Mr Warburton, or it wasn't, and if you're sure it was, then David Ellis is guilty of murder. Boom! What a speech, eh? Following the summing up by Mr Justice Knowles, in which he gave the jury legal direction as to the law of manslaughter and the defence of loss of control, after three days of deliberation, on the afternoon of Wednesday the 22nd of June 2016, the jury of nine women and three men returned to the courtroom to deliver a unanimous verdict of guilty of murder throwing out Ellis's loss of control claim. Sentence was adjourned until the following day, following which Mr Justice Knowles then lifted an order which had previously prevented publication of the details of Ellis's previous crimes, an order placed at the time to avoid any bias. Among the lengthy convictions he had, the court heard, were offences of theft, fraud and deception, benefit fraud, motoring offences, Oh, and that he was a convicted paedophile, having been jailed for five years at Chester Crown Court in 1996 for sexual offences against a young girl who it had been ruled could not be identified. It had been on this charge, or rather, non-disclosure of previous sexual offences when he'd entered the Republic of Ireland the previous year, that Ellis had actually been arrested and cursory held for. Before the sentencing, the court heard a victim impact statement from Alec Warburton's older brother Graham, in which he said, Alec was a loyal brother and friend and a good landlord to his tenants. I miss him deeply and he never deserved to die in the way that he did. I describe my brother as a gentle giant who would not hurt anyone and who's never been in trouble with the police. When I reported Alec missing, I was really worried because it was unusual not to have daily contact by phone with him. We had weeks of stress and anxiety, not knowing whether Alec was dead or alive. Mr Warburton continued by describing the numbness and shock felt when told of the discovery of his brother's body the previous September, and said that he now suffered depression and sleep deprivation because he can't switch off from what had happened. Referring to David Ellis, he said, He's a nasty, callous, perpetual liar who has deceived Alec's friends and family and the police. He even pretended to be my brother, sending me texts from Alec's phone within days of his death. On Thursday the 23rd of June 2016, David Craig Ellis stood in the very same dock as Mr Justice Knowles sentenced him to life imprisonment, telling him as he dismissed Ellis's sex for rent claims. I do not accept that Mr Warburton did more than ask you for the rent he was entitled to. Instead, the murder was done in the expectation of gain. 
it is a case of particularly high seriousness with statutory aggravating features including planning, which I find to be significant, and concealment of the body. Ellis was then told he would serve a minimum of 26 years imprisonment before ever being considered for release and said nothing before he was taken away to begin his sentence. He will be 67 years old by the time he can be considered for release on license. Following the sentencing, Felicity Galvin, Senior Crown Prosecutor for the Crown Prosecution Service Wales, said, David Ellis is responsible for a premeditated and brutal attack on Alec Warburton that left his victim with fatal injuries. Ellis went to great lengths to plan the attack and then attempt to cover his tracks. Prior to the attack, he devised a note that he used later to deceive Mr Warburton's tenants into believing he was still alive. He made concerted efforts to clean the murder scene and used Mr Warburton's phone to facilitate further deception of his victim's family and tenants. He then drove to North Wales to dispose of Mr Warburton's body before fleeing the country in a bid to evade justice. However, thanks to the diligence and persistence of the investigating and prosecuting teams, he was brought back to Wales to face up to his actions in a criminal court. While today's criminal case outcome cannot take away the hurt and loss felt by Mr Warburton's family and friends, we hope that Ellis's conviction may at least be of some comfort to them as they move forward with their lives. In October 2016, members of the late Alec Warburton's family, who were controlling his estate, sold number 60 Vivian Road at auction, offering the five-bedroom property as one with potential for conversion to a home of multiple occupation or for re-establishing as a single family property. Although similar properties on the same street were on offer for up to £190,000, number 60 went for far below this at just £126,000. A former neighbour of Alex said at the time, I lived next door in 2012 and it was a nice little home back then. I think £126,000 is a steal. But what happened inside was a real tragedy and the memory will linger there for some time. I'm not sure I'd like to live there. Perhaps the family just wanted to get rid quickly, the property holding too many painful memories for them to hang on to, who knows. And what are the instigator of those painful memories? I wonder how many memories David Ellis will carry with him until the 17th of June 2042, should he of course live that long, when he becomes eligible for release on parole. The tale of David Ellis and his horrific crime was nothing more than the taking of a human life in a nonchalant way, for what amounted to a little over a £1,000 gain, £1,140 to be exact. And that is proper premeditated murder that, isn't it? Because as highlighted, the only way he could ever have gotten away with his bloody harebrained scheme is for Alec Warburton to have been dead. And bearing in mind, this was a guy who'd done nothing to Ellis whatsoever except ask him for rent money which as his landlord was rightfully owed to him. So, and it boggled my mind a bit here this did, why commit such a serious offence for so little gain? Why don't you knock over a shop or a post office or something? where the hall would be much more lucrative and arguably, if you were caught, the penalty for doing so would be somewhat less than life imprisonment. So, yet although it's premeditated, it's no master crime at all, this is it. It does show the devious and ruthless nature of Ellis, granted. I mean, you've got the murder, which is pretty horrific enough as it is, isn't it? But you've also got the writing of the note and the almost plausible content of it. You've got disguising the car number plate with electrical tape concocting some nonsense about his landlord trying it on with him, jumping on the fact that Alec had an adventurous and varied sex life to make this sound plausible. He's one slippery fucker indeed, this Alice, isn't he? If he hadn't been found in Ireland when he was, the question is, would he likely have done it again? And that's a scary thought when you think that he had no qualms about killing, pretty much at the drop of a hat, and if anything, that was made easier, possibly even enjoyable for him, due to the documented animosity between the two. If he can kill that easily also, as Ellis possibly killed before. This is an offender with a broad spectrum of crime to his name, from fraudster right through to murderer, 
not for getting convicted paedophile. His movements over the years, well, when he wasn't incarcerated anyway, are quite sporadic and can't be pinpointed exactly. So is it possible that Ellis has committed murder previously? He's not saying either way. And he has until he's 67 years old to think about whether he even wants to, safely locked away from doing so again. Terrible tale this one, eh? And what an absolute waste of two lives, I'm sure you'll agree, as I said at the start, for the best part of bugger all, isn't it, eh? It's just so tragic, that is. One awful, awful thing to do. I'd love, as always, hearing your thoughts and feedback about the episode The Lethal Lodger and the Lost Landlord, and I'm sure that you don't need any reminding as to just where you can do so. There's a shiny episode thread up in the show's Facebook discussion group for you to do so, or equally, through any of the show's social media links that you can get me on, you know me guys, I'm always happy to talk. I'd like to thank you very much for joining me here today for an episode that I hope you found informative and interesting, and I hope that you can catch me again next time around for another tale from the True Crime Enthusiast podcast. All that remains to say is that I've been, I still am, and hopefully still will be Paul, the True Crime Enthusiast, wishing you guys all good and safe times, and I shall speak to you very soon. Take care all, thanks very much for joining me, and goodbye for now.